Hello everybody and welcome back to another engineering statics lecture video. In this lecture video we're going to be tackling friction which is something none of you guys have been waiting for. As you guys are going to see when we look in the theory friction isn't that tough from a theoretical standpoint. Where friction becomes tough for students is the applications because friction applies to everything. I got my microphone it has friction, I have my two hands, friction, computer, friction, it's everywhere. So what typically happens is students try to do as many practice problems as possible to get ready for exams. But I guarantee you, you can do a whole textbook of friction problems. Whatever you'll get on the exam will probably be something completely different than what you've seen because again, friction has so many applications. But we're going to go through the theory and hopefully you guys are saying, you know what, Clayton, you talk a lot of crap about friction, but it's actually pretty simple. At least that's what I'm hoping for anyways. Now, before we begin, of course, I hope you guys are all doing well, surviving. But for now, let's jump into friction. So friction. Friction basically occurs when two bodies come into contact with each other. So one example, of course, the simplest, I have two hands. I bring them together and I try and slide. Well, depending on how much pressure I put between them, it becomes really hard to slide my hands. Because what happens is when two surfaces come together, a frictional force develops between these two surfaces to resist the sliding. And of course we know this as friction. Now there's actually many types of friction, but we're gonna cover kind of the three most basic, and then for the rest of the course, we're gonna focus on one type of friction. So the first one is dry friction. So this is when a frictional resistance between two bodies develop when no lubricant is present. Now I know this is a first year class. As soon as I say lubricant, everyone's, <laughs> nice one, Clayton. Yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. and. Even though I say it's a first year class and first years are laughing, uh, I'm still laughing, so it shows how mature I am. <laughs> it's, it becomes really hard to teach this class when words like that come up, but what can you do? So basically, dry friction, no lubricant is present. And in this particular case, the friction is proportional to the normal force. As we are going to see, when we have two bodies that come together, the amount of friction between them depends on how much pressure is on that surface. Again, if I were to take my hands, and I were to kind of just gently touch and rub, as we can see, it's pretty simple. But if I were to compress my hands really hard and then try and slide, as we can see, it becomes a lot harder because again, the frictional force is proportional to that normal force on that surface. The second type is fluid friction. So this is the frictional resistance between two bodies when the lubricant is present. So what happens is if I were to lube my hands up, what would happen is there actually becomes a thin barrier between these two surfaces, which allows them to slide a lot more simply. The problem is, is friction becomes a function of velocity, pressure, temperature, becomes a function of basically everything in life. So the analysis gets a little complex. So we actually don't consider it too much in this course. It's, it's getting too complex. And the last one is internal friction. Now internal friction is an invisible type of friction. And I put invisible because it's on a very small scale because of course every friction is invisible. When I put my hands together, I don't just see a force appear. Uh, I say invisible because for internal friction, it occurs at a molecular level. So as you guys have taken chemistry, stuff like that, you guys know that actual atoms are arranged in particular orders. And what happens is when those two atoms touch, they create friction. Now this of course is the most complex type of friction and it's something that still has a lot of research going into it. One example from a structural engineering aspect is damping. In this course, we are gonna focus on the, the simplest one, which is going to be dry friction, all right? So hopefully you guys had all your laughs out of the way because now we're going to get into the actual fun and theory of it. So mechanics of dry friction. To understand it, basically, we have to look at the surface at a microscopic level. If I were to have basically a box on top of a surface and I were to try and push that box, well, it's fairly intuitive to us that we know that there's going to be a frictional force counteracting that motion. So we know that there's going to be a frictional force in the opposite direction of how I'm trying to push my box. But how is this force developed? Well, if I were to take that surface and zoom in on it, what happens is the surface isn't actually perfectly smooth. It's actually a little bit rugged, something like this. 
So if I have this scenario now, and I try and take that green surface and pull it across the purple surface, we know that there is going to be many points of contact on that surface. And when we have two points of contact, let's say my hands, a normal force develops between them. So at these two points that we have contact, we know that there is going to be a normal force developing at those points. Now here's the key, all right, here's the key. If we were to look at these forces the way that they are, and we were to split them into X and Y components, just like we've done with every other force, we can see that there is actually a horizontal component to these contact forces. That horizontal component, that is actually the frictional force providing the resistance. So this is what happens at a microscopic level. Now, you guys are looking at this and saying, oh, do we have to analyze it at a microscopic level? Well, no, of course not. It gets much more simple. This is just to show you guys where exactly friction comes from. Now, dry friction has a couple rules, but the rules are fairly intuitive. You guys are gonna look at this and say, Clayton, I know all these rules, so they're pretty simple. The first one is, our contact forces occur in equal and opposite pairs. Basically, if I were to press going to the right on one side, well, my resistance is going to be parallel and to the left, equal and opposite, which is Newton's third law. The second one is the contact forces are generated at every point of contact. Well, that makes sense. If I were to touch two surfaces together, well, there's going to be a force that develops between it. Fairly intuitive. And then the third one is the contact forces are perpendicular to the contact surface. So I don't really have a surface, but if you guys were to place your hand down on your desk, you know that the normal force is going directly upwards. The desk surface is horizontal, but the force itself is perpendicular to that surface. So again, they're all fairly intuitive. Now, let's say that we had two bodies that had perfectly smooth surfaces, all right? Perfectly smooth. Doesn't happen in reality, but let's say that we do. If we were to look at the contact points, only a vertical force develops because again, they're perfectly smooth surfaces. So as we can see, if we have a perfectly smooth surface, we don't have friction because those contact forces don't have a horizontal component. So as we're going to see, the smoother the surface, the less frictional force it can develop. The rougher the surface, the more frictional force it'll develop. But then again, of course, the question becomes, well, how exactly do we measure this? Well, we do this using friction coefficients. So this is where the actual analysis of friction starts to come into play. But again, it's gonna be pretty simple. You guys are going to laugh and say, oh, this isn't too hard. So let's consider the movements of a box due to a force. So I have a box, it's resting on a surface, and I just wanna push that box with the force P. Now, another thing that's going to come into play is going to be the weight of the box. There is a force, weight, that holds this box downwards on top of the surface. Now, the first force, which is pretty simple, is we're going to have a frictional force. And again, its direction is going to try and counteract the motion. So if I'm pushing that box to the right, my frictional force is going to counteract that and act to the left. Now, the next thing that we have is the normal force. And this is why the concept of weight becomes important. If I just put a normal force there and I didn't have a weight force, well, if I were to take equilibrium in the vertical direction, our normal force would be zero. But of course, it's not zero. It's actually proportional to the weight of the box itself. So this is our system. So the question becomes, how do we analyze or quantify this frictional force? Well, it's going to be simple. But again, don't be deceived. It can become quite complex. For this course, our frictional force is going to be a coefficient, which we call mu static or the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. That's it, right? You guys are looking at this and saying, Clayton, it's been eight weeks and you've been talking really dirty about friction, right? You just threw it to the curve, not very nice. And this is all it is? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Again, the theory of friction, not too bad. The applications, that's where it gets pretty bad. So if we were to look at this formula, we can find a couple of things. The first thing is when we apply this frictional force, it is typically directed opposite of motion. So again, if we look at the left, I'm pushing to the right, my frictional force goes to the left. And the other thing that comes from this formula is the amount of frictional resistance is proportional to the normal force. If I were to look at this formula here, it has N. So if I have more normal force, I'm going to have more friction. Again, it makes sense. If I were to lightly touch my hands, 
Well, I can rub them pretty simply, but if I were to compress my hands, well, then it becomes a lot harder to rub. All right, so the last thing we're gonna talk about in this particular slide is that the frictional force is simply the normal force multiplied by that coefficient. So we say, okay, N, that's the normal force, that's not too bad. In this particular diagram, it would be just proportional to the weight. But what about that coefficient of static friction? Well, this is something you'll typically be given or asked to solve for. It's not something that we have a formula to derive because all this coefficient depends on is the two surfaces that are creating friction. So the first one, as we can see for some typical examples, is metal on ice. Metal itself is a pretty smooth surface, and as you guys know, ice is an extremely smooth surface. So if we were to look at the coefficient of static friction between the two, it's pretty low. If we were to go to two rougher surface, let's say wood on wood, as we can see, the coefficient of static friction goes up. It's around 0.35. So the only takeaway here is the smoother the surface, the lower the coefficient. All right, so it's, it's not too bad so far. So sliding friction. The term static is another thing we have to discuss. Remember, in that formula that we had, we said us, and, or mu s, and we said that that is static friction. Now, whenever you hear static, well, you guys aren't too scared because everything in this course is static. But why do we have to specify static? Well, it's because there becomes a point, if I were to take two surfaces, compress them, and then try and slide, there becomes a point where slip occurs and motion occurs. So when actually the motion starts to occur, the coefficient of friction changes after motion occurs. So what happens is we have to analyze a non-static or a dynamic case. If we were to look at the figure on the previous slide and do some of the forces, we know that we're basically going to have P, which is our applied force, minus our frictional force. Now, if this was static, we know that the sum of the forces would be equal to zero. But if we were to analyze a non-static case, we know that the summation of forces is actually going to be equal to the mass times acceleration. All right? This is why I kind of laugh at the mechanical engineers. They always come to the civil engineers and say, you guys always have some of the forces equal to zero, easy peasy. Well, then I say, well, if it's not equal to zero, it's just mass times acceleration. It's also pretty easy. Uh, they, they don't like that too much. Always be nice to the mechanical engineers, all right? Always be nice to them, <laughs> or else they get really upset. So if we were to take this formula and we were to rearrange it, and I were to substitute my frictional formula for F, where we had mu times N, we get this formula. Now, if we were to look at the right-hand side, we have mass times acceleration. Basically, we went from a zero value, a static case, to a non-zero value. So that right-hand side, it has now increased. Now, if we were to look at the left-hand side and we want to try and account for that increase of the right-hand side, well, the only way to do that is to have a decrease in our coefficient of friction because P is going to stay the same, mu is going to stay the same. So the only way that we can make that right side increase is if we lower mu, okay? And this is what happens in that dynamic case. We have a coefficient of static friction, which is the friction when our two bodies are in equilibrium, nothing's moving. But once they start moving, we have a coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, if we were to plot this, it's going to look something like this. So I have a plot of applied force versus our developed frictional force. For the first region, which is our static region, we'll see a linear line that goes up to F max. So F max right here, this is going to be the maximum frictional force that can develop before sliding occurs. At the very end here, we have a very uh, important point. This is called the point of impending motion. So if I were to apply just a little bit extra force at this point, sliding is going to start occurring. So this is the maximum frictional force we can develop before sliding occurs. So what happens is after this point, we see a decrease and then we kind of see a constant frictional force, which we call the kinetic friction. So basically, if we were to look at these graphs, we have two different regions. Region number one is static equilibrium. At this point, nothing is moving, and basically the maximum friction we can develop, which is what we call F max, this is equal to our coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. If we were to look at region number two, oops, over here, this is when we have a dynamic case or a kinetic case where sliding is occurring, 
and our maximum friction resistance is going to be eukinetic multiplied by n. So yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.